Hello, and welcome to the joy of CSS. <laughs> I'm so glad people are pumped about CSS. Uh, <laughs> my name is Ceci Correa. Uh, I'm an engineer at Thinkful. Uh, we are a 100% online coding boot camp. Um, and I'm actually really excited uh, to be giving this talk today because I'm really really into teaching people about code. And one of the things um, that I first taught uh, was uh, HTML and CSS. And it can be an awesome experience because when someone is just getting started and this is like the first time they've ever written code and they start putting stuff on a page and they start changing colors and stuff like that, it can be really exciting. And if you make that a positive, a positive experience, then you've gained, hopefully, someone um, else that will be a, a fan of coding forever. So I'm, I'm really into talking about um, those sort of basic subjects, because I feel like that's where the difference, um, that's where you can really make a difference when you're teaching someone how to code. So I'm uh, really excited today to be talking to you about CSS. Uh, and specifically, CSS uh, is really near and dear to me, uh, because like many people uh, that grew up in the 90s or thereabouts, uh, I got my start doing anything computer related with GeoCities. Um, I will absolutely admit I had a GeoCities website. Uh, I have tried to look for it. I've gone on the Wayback Machine and I have not been able to find it. If any of you, I dare you to find it. Uh, and if, if you are able to find it, you can just uh, tweet at me. I'm at Ceci Correa, C-O-R-R-E-A, on Twitter. If you find it uh, and you're like a wizard uh, and you send it to me, I'm going to be so grateful. But since I don't have that site right now that I can show you, I can describe it to you. And I can absolutely tell you that my GeoCities website had a space background. I was using Comic Sans because I wanted to. I was using it unironically, and I absolutely had a under construction GIF, because how else would people know that you know the site was still under construction? I was still figuring things out. I was still figuring myself out. Uh, and years later, uh, a completely new generation of uh, coders came into the picture who were introduced to coding through MySpace. Yes, because MySpace allowed you to style your page with CSS. And if you knew a little bit of CSS, there were a lot of things you could do. I remember spending so much time changing the borders of all of my containers and then playing around with the cursors. If you remember, you could add a little like space dust to your cursor. There are so many things you could do. And a lot of those things I wouldn't do now <laughs> knowing what I know <laughs> of good UX best practices, but that's really where uh, my, my love for CSS and my love for programming really grew, and it gave me a lot of confidence to think, like, maybe this is something that I can do. So for a lot of us that got our start in this way, playing around with, say, GeoCities or MySpace, a lot of us come from non-traditional backgrounds. Uh, a lot of us tend to be women, a lot of us tend to be uh, underrepresented minorities. So when we talk about things like CSS and JS and people look at CSS not so seriously, dismissing it like it's just layout logic, it's not really anything fancy, it's not really worth learning is some things that I've heard about CSS. There's a lot to unpack there, uh, a lot of, um, Feelings are like under the surface, um, and it all comes down to almost like dismissing this community uh, of people like me who come from non-traditional backgrounds. Who this is how we started. This was our gateway into development and what we do now, which might be completely different than back when we were just playing around with gifts um, in GeoCities. So there's there's a lot there. So I I really wanted to have a talk where I talked about CSS and why I find it uh, really just fun to work with. And I also wanted to talk about 
some reasons why some people might not find it fi uh, fun to work with and try to address that, to try to bring that joy back into CSS. So I wanna talk about tips uh, for making CSS better for your day to day. Kind of borrowing from Bob Ross, I'm gonna try to think about putting together a painting. So we gotta start with that base. He always started by painting a base and he would always paint the clouds and paint the mountain. And that would be like the base for um, his painting. And then after that, he would fill in some of those trees. So we're gonna add some happy little trees and talk about some more intermediate uh, CSS type of things that you can do. Uh, and then we're gonna talk about the future of CSS and what's coming. It's so exciting with CSS Grid, we have variables, we have Houdini. It's, there hasn't been a better time to be doing CSS than right now. So let's get started. So the base, let's talk about some basic pain points that uh, people might have. So um, pain point number one uh, that I typically see people struggle with is targeting a specific element. Now. Uh, this gets into something called CSS specificity, and most people are familiar with the basic principles of this. So you have uh, an element, like a p tag, uh, and then a class supersedes that, and then an ID supersedes that. That's the basics of CSS specificity. Most people get that, but what happens when you start adding more things into the mix? things can get dicey. So this is where learning CSS specificity with Star Wars really helped me gain a better understanding of how to better target different elements. Now, this, these are not my ideas. These are ideas that I found. Uh, the very first time that I tried to explain CSS, uh, I came uh, across this post on Stuff and Nonsense um, from a fella named Andy Clark. Uh, and he was talking about uh, CSS through Star Wars uh, specificity specifically. So you have a P tag, a stormtrooper, pretty easy to understand, uh, two stormtroopers, so two element tags. Um, what about a class? Okay, a class is like uh, Darth Maul, it's a little bit more powerful. What about uh, a element in a class? Okay, it's a little bit more powerful. What about two elements in a class. Okay, we're, we're getting there. What about two classes? Wow, okay, that's two Darth Balls. That's pretty darn specific. What about an element, a class, an element, and a class? Okay, now we have two Stormtroopers, we have two Darth Balls. We're getting pretty specific. Boom, an ID, Darth Vader, okay. Now, now we're getting there. Now we're kind of realizing that progression of how the mix of things kind of affects that specificity, right? What about an element and an ID? Okay, that trumps all of that. What about a class, an element, and an ID? Okay, that's like a Darth Vader and a Stormtrooper and Darth Maul together. Wow, that's pretty specific. Okay. Two classes and an ID, two Darth Mauls and a Darth Vader. Okay, that's pretty darn powerful. Boom, inline styles. <laughs> the Emperor. Okay, that, that is pretty powerful and that trumps pretty much everything else. And then you have important, which is the Death Star. And it should absolutely be treated like the Death Star. That's when Going back to the CSS and JS argument, I specifically remember reading someone who said, you don't need to learn CSS, just use important. And they said this unironically, because I checked, and they said they were absolutely serious. And the thing about using important a lot is that it's kind of like in The Incredibles when the bad guy talks about how he wants to give everybody superpowers because when everybody's super, nobody is. And it's the same thing with important. Once you start using important a lot, when everything is important, nothing is. So you really want to use it sparingly and just take the time to really dig through CSS specificity. If you want to learn more about it, I highly recommend you just Google CSS specificity Star Wars, you'll probably uh, come, come across this blog post. And if you want to learn or practice CSS specificity a little bit more, there's this great thing called CSS Diner. Uh, it's over at flukeout.github.io. And this is a series of drills that you can do uh, to level up your CSS specificity. So for example, here it says select the plates. We look, like, we look at the code over here and we see, okay, plate, 
boom, we did it. Select the bento boxes, and just like this, and you keep on going, uh, and it'll get progressively way, way harder. Like, it gets hard. Uh, so I highly recommend that you go through that. Cool. All right, so pain point number two, code is not dry, it's hard to read. Usually this is because of bad habits that I tend to see when people are creating layouts. Uh, so bad naming conventions and not thinking about reusability. Uh, so a very wise person once said that there are only two hard things in computer science, cache invalidation and naming things. And naming things in CSS is no different. It's, it can be a pain, it can be hard. So one of the things that I typically see people do you have, say you have this layout, you have maybe like a pricing table. This is actually uh, a pricing table that I saw uh, on a product that I was uh, looking at recently. So this is totally a real layout. And usually uh, what I see when people try to implement something like this is that they'll name things like box one, box two, box three. Uh, and sometimes you might get something like yellow box, green box, blue box. Now this works. Uh, but it can be improved. So typically when people use that pattern of box one, box two, box three, they're focusing on the things that are different amongst the boxes. But what you really wanna do to try to make this a little bit more reusable is to focus on the things that are similar between the boxes and then handling the exceptions as different classes. Uh, and then also try to use things that are gonna be more reusable uh, in the future. So for example, how I would approach something like this is creating a a pricing-based class that has all of the elements that these boxes have in common. So for example, uh, they all have the same width and height. They all seem to have the same border. They all seem to have uh, the same border radius. They all seem to have the same box shadow. And then after that, you can handle the exceptions such as the yellow, the green text, and the blue background. And you could handle it by adding classes like yellow, green, blue. Uh, but I would preferably like to use something a little bit more semantic, like micro, large, and maybe like highlight. Because if you were to name this yellow, green, and blue, what if marketing says, you know what, that yellow is not testing so well, we wanna make that purple. Now all of a sudden you have a class called yellow that you're gonna have to rename purple and you're gonna have to find all of the usages everywhere and change that. Uh, where if you named it something a little bit more semantic, like, like say micro, then all you would have to do is just change the color in that class and boom, that's it. Um, so that's, those are typically some of the things that I like to do uh, when I'm breaking down a, a problem in CSS. Further reading on naming, uh, there is this standard called BEM, B-E-M, Block Element Modifier, that a lot of people like to use. Um, and then there are also other alternatives like plus and BEM, uh, soup CSS, and ABEM. Uh, I think that it all comes down to preference. If you typically do stuff on your own, it might come down to your personal preference. If you do things as part of a team, uh, then it might merit um, an evaluation of all, of, the, of all of the different options out there and a talk with your team to figure out what best suits your needs. But there's definitely a lot of um, patterns that you can leverage there. The next thing that I wanna talk about is color. So it's not really a pain point, more of a tip. Uh, that actually it took me a long time into my career as a developer to figure out what was happening in color in CSS. Uh, so say you have a problem where someone says, can you, I like this design, but can you make the button, the blue button, can you make it bluer? And then you're like, sure. Uh, <laughs> there is a way that you can do it with science. So let's talk about how hex colors work. So many of you, if you're using uh, a hex code in your CSS, you might have seen something like a hashtag and then an alphanumeric string, uh, typically uh, six or three characters long, uh, and usually it's red, green, and blue, red, red, green, green, blue, blue, depending on the values. If the values for red and green and blue are the same, then you can just use three, uh, so RGB. So if you have a color like 00F, and zero is 0% zero of that color, and F is 100% of that color, then what would 0% red, 0% green, and 100% blue be? Blue! <laughs> uh, if we had something like this, so 100% red, 0% uh, green, 0% blue, 
It's red. So what I like to do when I break down something like this um, is play around with the values. So right now, here we have 100% red, some green, and a little bit of blue. What happens if I turn up the green all the way and give that 100%? We get yellow. What happens if I make blue 0%? Boom, we get pure yellow. So then if you start looking at this, you can start seeing how that value progresses in that uh, spectrum. And I think it's really interesting. So now if someone says, hey, I want you to make this thing blue, you can literally use something like this to try to increase the value of that blue color and uh, play around with the other values for, green, for red and green and then try to arrive at something uh, that's more blue. Or you can talk to a designer and they'll give you a better color. But just in case, um, you can play around with it. Also, another pro tip, if you literally just type color picker into Google, it pops up this really useful color picker that you can use and play around with. I actually use this all the time. Uh, I used to go to a website called Color Lovers uh, a lot to pick out uh, different like color schemes, and now I pretty much just use this color picker, picker whenever I need to like uh, get a quick color uh, whenever I'm designing something um, typically for myself, because uh, usually a designer will give you really nice colors to work with. Okay, so now it's part of, uh, or time for our talk to talk about adding some of those little happy trees to try to add a little bit more uh, to our painting. So, the first thing I want to talk about here is how we can level up our uh, SAS or SCSS. Um, some of the things that I typically like to, to do is to uh, break up uh, your files. Sometimes I come into a project and I end up seeing like a super large uh, CSS file, SCSS file, and one of the, it, that can be really daunting to work with because you don't really know what you're looking at. Um, so a file structure that I tend to like, I got this from the sasway.com, uh, is uh, splitting things out into modules, partials, and vendor. So in your modules folder, you would have things like your variables, your mixins, uh, stuff that doesn't get compiled into the CSS per se. Uh, and your partials, that's where you have most of your layout stuff, most of your logic. So if you could have a partial for a header, you could have a partial for a sidebar, stuff like that. You can even uh, break it down further into a partial for typography. That's something that I tend to use a lot because type styles can get pretty lengthy. Um, so that's typically how I like to structure my own projects. Uh, and then you can have a vendor folder uh, where you can have uh, third party code. Um, another uh, advantage of this uh, is that your main SCSS file is gonna be essentially a bunch of imports. Um, but I think that this might be, um, might be a little bit easier to try to parse because you essentially say, okay, I need to change something in the header. You know there's a partials header. You can go to partials header and check it out. So I feel like it might give people a little bit more direction or a little bit um, more of a, a, a place where to start when they start, um, when they are onboarded onto a project. Another thing uh, is naming your bars. And this uh, kind of goes back to this idea of trying to name things in a way that is more reusable. Uh, one of the things that I see a lot is uh, var naming like this. This is perfectly fine, um, and it's reasonable. You have variables in SAS that allows you to save a value. So if you have a value for red that's F4E242, you're probably not gonna remember that. You probably don't wanna type that all the time, so throw it into a variable call it something like red, it makes sense. But for me, an optimization that I like to make here is to maybe name it something a little bit more reusable, like primary, because what happens when, again, someone says, hey, you know what? We don't really want all of these things to be red. We want these things now to be yellow. So now you have to change the name of the variable and then change it everywhere else where it's used. Mind you, if you're using an IDE, those type of things, can be fairly easy, but personally, I just, if you already start with a name that's a little bit more reusable, uh, then all you have to do is just change that value. And I find that to be a little bit easier um, if you ever need to go back to that code. Same thing can be said for font styles. So instead of something like naming a variable after the font, which is something that I also t uh, tend to see a lot, uh, I tend to like uh, using a pattern where I'm using something like 
more descriptive, like body or headline, subhead. Uh, that way, again, if that needs to be changed, then I just change it in that place, um, and then everything else propagates. I, will, I always try to think in terms of powerful mix-ins. So I'm always trying to see like what are things that I can combine to try to make something uh, to make my laugh, life a little bit easier later on. Uh, so one mix-in that I typically use a lot in my projects is something like this, um, where I have font family, font size, font color, and then uh, just with just one line, you can uh, specify all of that. You can even reuse some of your variables like body and then pass in uh, things like the size and the color. And then that way you've saved yourself three lines of code uh, and you turn that into just one. Um, okay, so that's it for SCSS Flex. Uh, Flex is really cool. Uh, I like to think just like video killed the radio star, Flex killed the clear fix star. Not sure if it was ever a star, though. Um, and flex is neat because it gives you more flexibility uh, in how you design a layout. Uh, essentially, uh, flex allows a parent container uh, to figure out how it should fill its own space. And it's also um, space agnostic, so it allows you to move uh, or position things horizontal horizontally and vertically. Uh, so it makes uh, things like creating a nav bar just that much easier. So for example, uh, this is a typical pattern that you see. You might have a main content uh, container and then a sidebar container. Uh, in the old way, you would likely have something like container, and it would have a width, and then you would have a sidebar. That would have a float. Then you would have a main. That would also have a float. And each of those things would have a width. Um, and that worked, uh, but with flex, it's actually a lot simpler because um, once you say display flex, uh, the default direction for flex is row. So just saying display flex will default uh, that to a uh, row type of display. So we get this for free. Uh, and then after that, all you have to do is specify the width of the sidebar. And then based on that, main knows that it just needs to occupy the rest of the space. So you don't really need to uh, specify uh, main if you don't want to. So for example, I have a code pen where we can play around uh, with this. Uh, this is actually uh, something that I ended up doing um, for my current work. Uh, we wanted to do something where we had this like schedule uh, and I used flex to essentially tell this container we want all of this to take up all of the space and this just to take up what it needs to. And uh, I did that by using uh, this property called grow. Um, so here if I say flex grow one, I'm essentially just uh, telling uh, this little box, hey, we want this to take up as much of the space as possible and then the rest can just be sort of like figured out. So this is how I was able to get this alignment, which if I hadn't used flex, it would be much more of a pain to try to uh, accomplish. And this lives right now on this website. Um, it ended up being a little bit different uh, once we shipped it, uh, but it started off like this. So this is something that you can totally use today to try to create um, some neat uh, components. Cool, all right. Uh, that's an example in prod. And then uh, I shouldn't have clicked out of that. I should have just taken you to Flexbox Froggy. This is actually how I learned Flex. So Flexbox Froggy is a game that uses Flex to have you help the frog get to its lily pad. Um, so here, uh, it'll give you some instructions like, hey, you can use just justify content to try to align the frog and have it find the lily pad. So here you can say, Justify content. Uh, we probably want flex end. So this means go all the way to the end of the flex space. Um, so now the froggy goes all the way to the end. Uh, here, let's see. Justify content center. Yay. Um, so literally, this is uh, 24 levels. It does get dicey, 
Uh, and it's kind of similar to uh, CSS Diner that I showed you earlier. And I think this can really help cement those ideas of flex uh, if you're looking for a way to uh, either learn or level up. The next thing I want to talk about is pseudo elements. And I feel like pseudo elements are highly underrated uh, and sometimes just not leveraged as much as you could. So uh, some of the pseudo classes that you might see are things like uh, last of type, last child, nth of type, nth child. Um, so I'm a big fan of using something like this uh, to try to um, create uh, layouts. So here I'm gonna try to both combine flex and then use a pseudo class to try to create a nav bar real quickly. Um, so first of all, let's say that you want that sign up CTA to be red just so that it can pop. Um, so here you could say something like this, last of type. And then you can say that this is gonna be color red. And now it's red. Uh, and then with flex, if we say that we wanted to create a nav bar that was uh, horizontal, we could just say display flex. It's gonna look ugly because there's no spacing, but now we just add a little bit of space. Oh yeah, that's right. Oh, you're so good. It's always different when you're coding in front of people. You just suddenly become the stupidest person on earth. Uh, so boom. Obviously this is a very bare bones type of nav, but now you can start to see how uh, using things like pseudo classes with flex, you can start getting somewhere really quickly. All right. Uh, the other pseudo classes that I tend to use a lot are checked, active, hover, disabled. Specifically, I use checked quite a bit uh, to build things like uh, navigation or toggles. Um, so here is another code pen that I can show you where uh, I created a very basic, again, very bare bones uh, menu. This could be almost like a mobile menu if you wanted to, uh, where I'm using um, a label that will later be invisible. And I'm using the state, uh, the pseudo class checked to see if that label is checked, apply different styles to a different class. Uh, so the first thing I wanna do uh, is show, I have menu close, which is this X right here. This is gonna become a button where you click on it and it will close uh, the toggle. Uh, so let's actually add those styles right now. Have a bit of a style to try to add it uh, and make it look a little bit more like a button. And then I'm gonna say uh, menu close as the start of display none. So now you can't see that close button. Um, and then now I'm gonna leave that checkbox visible so that you can see uh, the interaction. So the next thing is to set menu as a default value of display none, so now you can't see the menu. So now if that checkbox is checked, oh yeah, I actually have to uncomment out that functionality. So here, if the checkbox is checked, what I'm saying is, if this is checked, then I want the menu to be displayed, uh, and I want menu open, which is this label with the three dots, which is essentially just my quickie way of trying to have a hamburger icon. Um, I want that to be display none, and I also want that when this checkbox is checked, I want menu close to display. So it's pretty easy functionality just based on that one check mark. And then you can see when I deselect it, all of those styles go away if it is checked. You can see that the button to close is toggled and that the menu uh, is displayed. If you add some CSS animations on top of this, you can start getting some really nice, fancy functionality fairly quickly. So now, if I finally set this menu toggle to display none, that checkbox goes away, but it's just, it's just hidden, it's still there, and that functionality is still there. So again, these are some ways that you can get some pretty 
I would say fancy functionality with just CSS, not even having to write any JavaScript. Cool. So let's talk about the future, because the future is really exciting. Um, first thing is CSS variables. So now we have variables. If you use something like SCSS, you might be uh, used to that little dollar sign. Uh, but now we have variables in CSS. Uh, you define them and you use them slightly differently. Uh, so you use two dashes. Then you name the variable, you give it a value, and then to use them, you have to call var and then give it the value of the variable that you want. So it's a little bit different than what you might be used to. Uh, another big difference between the variables in CSS and the variables in uh, SCSS is that uh, they are scoped. So if you want global var variables uh, right now, you have to uh, maybe add them to the root. Uh, and then if you want local variables, you add them to a specific class or selector. Um, so here, we would have a primary color of blue uh, as a global variable, but for dot .btn, that would actually be red because that local variable would take um, precedent over the global one. Can you use it? This is changing all the time. Uh, the last time that I checked this, it wasn't as uh, largely supported, uh, but now it really seems like most of the major browsers kind of support it, um, so might be worth looking into. Uh, CSS Grid is another uh, thing that is in the future, but not really. It's almost really here now, uh, and it's really neat. Uh, so. The difference uh, between CSS Grid and, say, Flex is that CSS Grid was specifically designed with layout in mind. So back in the before time, in the long, long ago, we used to build layout with things like tables and divs, things that weren't meant for us to use for layout. That's why they were painful to work with, and I think that's why a lot of people didn't have a good experience using CSS. You had to do all these hacks to get uh, these very basic things like layouts, but no longer. CSS Grid was specifically made with layout in mind. Uh, and CSS Grid is two-dimensional, whereas Flex is one-dimensional. So the difference is, because you might be wondering, well, if we have CSS Grid, then why do we need Flex for? So Grid is really meant uh, to be used with more lar larger scale um, layout, so say you might use grid to lay out an entire page, whereas you might use flex to do little uh, layouts within a component. So again, to go back to the navbar example, you might use uh, the actual grid to place the navbar, but the spacing and the alignment within the navbar, you might use flex for that. So really, CSS grid and flex are meant to be used sort of like side by side. Uh, so it's a very exciting time. Now, uh, if you want to learn more uh, about CSS uh, Grid, you can go to CSS Grid Garden, and you betcha we're going to go and look at it right now. Now, if this looks a little bit like Flexbox Froggy, it's because it's kind of meant to. Uh, I believe it was made by maybe some of the same people, or at least inspired. Um, by Flexbox Froggy, and again, this is how I learned uh, CSS Grid. Uh, it's a really effective way um, of uh, learning these things, uh, and also kind of fun. Now, um, oh, I could have sworn I had a slide for can I use CSS Grid, and again, it looks to be mostly there for most of the major browsers, um, so definitely still Definitely a good time to start learning that right now. Now, we have CSS Houdini. CSS Houdini is really, really interesting because it's essentially making CSS extendable. Um, from uh, houdini.glitch.me, uh, which is put together uh, by Sam Richard, who does, does a lot of work uh, with the CSS Houdini project, uh, he explains uh, CSS Houdini as much like service workers are a low-level JavaScript API for the browser's cache, Houdini introduces low-level JavaScript APIs for the browser, browser's render engines. So this means that you are able to extend CSS. So yeah, you can now write JavaScript in your CSS. So here in this example, you can see we're actually using this background canvas uh, 
variable, it takes some parameters and it actually has some JavaScript in there uh, to do something rather neat. Um, so we've kind of gone full circle from this idea of like CSS and JS. Well, now we also have JS and CSS and it's a very exciting time to be alive and be doing all of these things. So let me show you. Here, uh, Chrome Labs has a lot of really neat examples and you can also go and poke around at all that code. So for example, uh, we have uh, this one that I really like, this checkerboard and you're like, okay, this is just some boxes. What? <laughs> now, also, if you think about it, does this not kind of remind you of back in the day, a lot of the GeoCities stuff that you used to have? So again, we're going back full circle. Uh, another one that I tend to like, uh, where was this one? Nope. I don't think it was this one, but I haven't seen this one. Heidi Bar. Some of these don't actually work. <laughs> because CSS is not, or CSS Houdini is not widely uh, supported yet. Um, this one, uh, expand to effect. Okay, this one's crazy. <laughs> it's a little bit janky, um, <laughs> but. Again, when you take into consideration that this is at the very beginning stages, you can start to uh, think about uh, some things that you could do once this gets to a more stable position. Uh, so I'm very excited about CSS Houdini. I really feel like uh, this is how I felt when responsive design was become, starting to become a thing. It just felt like, oh, what is this new thing? It's like so exciting. Uh, I feel like CSS Houdini is also kind of like uh, th that verge of like opening us up to more possibilities of what you can do with CSS. As you were able to see from my demo, it is not super supported yet, uh, but you can check out is uh, HoudiniReadyYet.com uh, to see the status of that project. And if you want some further reading, uh, CSS Houdini Rocks is really good, uh, and then also Houdini.glitch.me uh, talks a lot more about all the different APIs uh, for Houdini. Uh, and to wrap things up, uh, just wanted to say that, yes, the future of CSS is very exciting. Uh, and um, remember that we don't make mistakes. We just have happy little accidents. Uh, thank you. <laughs>